Welcome to the 47th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Urs Wiedemann uh, from CERN. He got his PhD degree in mathematical physics from Cambridge University in 1994. He had a postdoctoral position at Regensburg University between 95 and 98. Between 99, uh, 98 and 99, he was a postdoc at Columbia University. And then he became a fellow at CERN in 1999. He was promoted to junior staff member in 2001 and finally to a senior staff member in 2006. He is uh, a co-author of the book on gauge string duality, hot QCD and heavy ion collisions that was, pu was published by Cambridge University in 2014. He has a wide research interest uh, in quantum chromodynamics, physics of heavy ion collisions, quark gluon plasma, physics of high energy jets, gauge string duality, hydrodynamic methods in quark gluon plasma and many other things. And today he will be talking about Oops, where's the title of the talk? Uh, flow and jet quenching in small systems. And uh, with that, I'll give the microphone to Urs. Well, thank you, Igor. Thank you very much for this kind introductory words. Um, so this will be a colloquium style presentation. Huh? So I emphasize concepts rather than technicalities. I shall argue wherever possible in terms of pictures and analogies. And I'll really start basic on an undergraduate non-expert level. Um, let me start by oops, let me start by stating that all forms of matter we know are of corpuscular composition. Examples light is corpuscular as evidenced by the threshold behavior of the photoelectric effect. And if we look at atoms, we know since rather for scattering experiments that they are composed of, of corpuscular objects, the electrons and the nuclei. So the quantum theory of electromagnetic interactions allows us to understand these and um, all other phenomena that emerge from electromagnetic interactions, the atomic structure, the chemistry, much more. If we zoom into the nucleus, then we know that it's composed of nucleons. By now, we know about more than 4,000 nucleids objects in which neutrons and protons can be put together in stable or metastable states. We can transmutate between them in the laboratory. And knowing this chart, we know how the chemical, why the chemical composition of our universe is what it is. We know it from primordial nuclear synthesis. We know it because that's the physics that we study in the laboratory, and that lets us understand hot and dense thermal objects like these violent star explosions that create the heavy elements. If we zoom in once more into the proton, then there is a completely different world. We can try to look into the proton, but we cannot isolate its basic constituents. In fact, if we do that, we excite the, the proton into hadrons. We know by now more than 3,000 light flavored hadronic excitations of the proton, but the proton is the only stable hadron. We know since the 1960s that this hadronic zoo can be classified in quarks, in terms of, of valence quarks. And we know since the elastic and elastic scattering experiments of the Stanford Linear Collider at the end of the 80s, that these quarks are not only um, ordering principles, but that they are dynamical quantities. If we kick them hard in a nucleon, what happens is on short distances, they behave as if they were free. But as we try to pull them out of the nucleon, the forces get stronger and stronger and stronger. 
in fact, they get infinitely strong. Uh, we cannot separate them. We break them into quark antiquark pairs. It's said often that Gross, Wilczek, and Politzer, in discovering asymptotic freedom, discovered QCD in 1973. But they discovered much more because at the time, in the, throughout the 1950s and 60s, theorists thought that the short distance limit of the quantum field theory of the combination of quantum mechanics and, and special relativity, that this combination would lead to increasing um, couplings. Uh, they, theorists thought for a long time hence that one could not formulate possibly the Hartron's Hadronic world in terms of the quantum field theory. And what these people did by discovering a field theory that is strong at few energy, at small energies, that means at large distances, and that is weak at high energies, that is short distances, they rehabilitated essentially the entire theoretical framework of quantum field theory on which our microscopic picture rests today. Now, what they discovered QCD is really at the basis of what we do at the CERN Large Hartron Collider and what one has done before at, at other Hartron Colliders and Electron Positron Colliders. There's this concept that at long distance quarks are confined in Hartrons, there's infrared slavery. There's this concept that at short distance, there's asymptotic freedom, so the interaction is very small. And throughout the decades, starting from that Lagrangian, we have learned how to make calculus with them, how to do precise calculations. So today's picture of a proton-proton collision in the vacuum at LHC is the picture where we draw these free, free partons from the incoming hadronic wave functions on distances on which they don't interact which, with each other. They can be negligible at the first instances. They collide. And the first part of this fragmentation is so highly energetic that it can be described perturbatively in terms of individual weak couplings giving rise to these characteristic parton showers. And then, as we go further and further on in, the pro in this process, infrared slavery sets in again. The world hadronizes. The two protons, we could say that we have excited, end up in bunches of hundreds of hadrons. Okay? So, one of the most characteristic emerging phenomena of this quantum chromodynamics, this fundamental theory of strong interactions is the emergence of jets. They are the closest we get to single partons. What we calculate in the most elementary way is drawing two partons from two hadrons, colliding them and getting, for instance, a die jet. And by energy momentum conservation, these jets are ideally balanced back to back and the little deviation in the energy they carry, we understand by the fragmentation pattern of the partons, it's energy that sits outside. Clearly, there is much more nowadays to, this to making this technology not only a concept, but an actual calculation. There is more in the parton shower description here. There is more understanding of how hadronization can be interfaced without introducing um, uncontrollable uncertainties for some quantities, how this is interfaced with the way we measure jets and so on. To give you a sense to what extent QCD in the vacuum is a success story. I just flashed this slide which shows cross sections over almost 10 orders of magnitude calculated reliably in a combination of this QCD and electroweak theory. So the rarer the process in general, the more accurate the calculation because the smaller in general the coupling constant is. But 
while modeling on the soft physics side remains modeling and is not so well controlled, the concept of parkon showers that don't talk anymore to each other and that free stream and fragment to the detector is also a good starting point for modeling soft physics as illustrated here for proton-proton collisions. Now let me change gears the first time. I want to ask what happens if we embed this QCD or this hadronic world in a finite density environment at high temperature. And the first person who has considered that was Hagedorn. He said, essentially, if I excite proton and I get a lot of hadrons out, what happens if I take the hadrons, I put them in a box, and I shrink the box to a normal hadronic size? And since all there is is hadrons, by shrinking the hadrons into a typical characteristic small volume, I should get another hadron. That was his idea, which he formulated in an equation called the Hagen on statistical bootstrap. It's an equation for the density, the number of hadronic states of mass m if put into a characteristic volume. And what he noted, or rather the mathematician who solved this equation first exactly was the German Werner Nahm. What he noted was that this leads to a hadronic world in which the mass spectrum is exponentially rising. If I ask how many hadrons are there of mass m, the higher m exponentially more hadrons I will have. Indeed, if you read out these 300 plus, 3000 plus hadrons that we know by now, they follow approximately such exponential mass spectra. Hagedorn noted that this can be interpreted as a thermal distribution, or that was hidden, so that it should not be possible to heat such a hadron gas above a temperature that we refer to as Hagedorn temperature. If you try to make this system denser, it's not that the energy goes into an increase of temperature, it's that the energy goes into an increase of the number of very massive had new hadronic states. Now, what Kabibu and Parisi shortly after the discovery of asymptotic freedom realized that it's not the partition function of this state that is divergent. So it's not a maximal temperature, rather it was the first derivative of that partition function that diverged. And that is according to Ehrenfest's classification a sign of a first order phase transition. So they were the first to conjecture this system shows a phase transition to a high temperature phase. And with the advent of QCD, it was immediately concluded by several people that this high temperature phase should be accounted by the partonic world formulated in QCD. So this is the beginning of a long journey study on the theory side that lasted over, I would say, quantitatively 30 years, but one will see precursors before 1990s, to a quantitative understanding of this phase transition from a hadronic world at a temperature around 150, 170 MeV to a, a partonic world. By, no, by now, we know that for realistic quark masses, this transition is not a first order transition, it's not a second order transition, it's a, a fast crossover. Now, if I turn this temperature into a critical energy density, I realize that it's the critical energy density is only three to five times the energy density of normal cold nuclear matter. And that led very early to the ideas that by colliding nuclei, it should be a possible to compress the hadronic matter, to compress it because three to five is not so far out of reach. 
and thereby to recreate the high temperature phase. And to make this clear, such a recreation of such a phase transition would be more than heating water and getting it from ice to, to, a, to liquid to a gas. This is a phase transition of a fundamental quantum field. That means characteristic properties of the ground state we live in, of the vacuum change, the chiral condensate, for instance, melts. It's the only quantum field theory, fundamental quantum field theory, where we can test how the non-abelian quantum fields transit change degrees of freedom. So that's why this was of since 30 years or so of fundamental interest. And while it led to an experimental program that started at Bevalak and that exponentially rising with center of mass energy led up to lead lead nuclei at the LHC, where per lead lead nucleus, more than 10 to the 6 GeV, so 10 to the 6 proton masses, a million proton masses, are available for particle production in energy. Okay. So clearly now I have to go fast forward. I enter the physics and I ask, what do we see in lead lead collisions at the LHC? And the first I do is I go into a counting house of one of the control centers at LHC and I stare at a screen. And what I see by staring at that screen, I see single event, so from a single lead-lead collision, the calorimeter distribution, the energy distribution in the plane transfers to the colliding beam. So each of these events, these are more than 10,000 particles that hit the detector. And I see by naked eye that the energy distribution is elongated. It's elliptic in shape here. So now I can ask, which dynamics is at play? What is it that makes these events elliptic? And I could have very simple pictures. I showed you, for instance, in proton-proton die jet events. I could wonder what happens if my lead-lead collision is nothing but an incoherent superposition of arbitrary many such die jet events, back-to-back -back events. Well, what would happen is Yes, with a single die jet event, I would have something extremely elongated here. But the more of them I superimpose, the rounder this gets, because these jets don't talk to each other. They can go in arbitrary directions. So I would conclude that the asymmetry of my event should shrink with the multiplicity of the event, with the number of particles. However, I see exactly the opposite. So just by staring at a screen, I can already rule out a simple hypothesis. Namely, the hypothesis that these calculations are dull, that nothing happens that I cannot assess as well in proton-proton collisions. Then, of course, comes the question, what happens? To what extent? Do these die jets that are schematically pictured here interact with each other in the final state to create a symmetry, a symmetry of this size? And that is a question to be tested quantitatively. I will get back to it. Let me stare at another picture in that counting house. I showed you a die jet event, two jets well balanced back to back. What I can do here. I can simply along the beam direction and transverse in azimuth around the beam direction, I can roll up the energy decomposition. I see that in such heavy ion collisions, lots of particles are produced. There is a lot of energy here in this gray rubble. But I see again the distinct jets, the, the characteristic emerging phenomena of QCD. And I see event by event, die jets with extremely large asymmetry, as if one jet was stuck in the medium and barely made it out while the other emerged 
freely. So like in the previous picture, I have an idea that there is a material there, a material that stops the highest energetic probes that I inject into it, and the material that expands collectively. And I'm asked by staring at the screen in this counting house to look at the dynamics of how the single parton emerging as a seed for a jet interacts with that material in order to create that reduced jet that I'm looking at. Now I talked about medium. So I have to say, how can I get an idea about how to test medium properties in such a system? It seems the system is too short-lived to touch it, to, to operate it with it like a solid state. I can't put it on this table and just wiggle around with it. But to give you a sense of how powerful physics is, let me just say that you have no measurement equipment and that you go at the end of this pandemics into a concert again. And the people tune their chords, they are their instruments, and you close your eyes. And everyone tunes to 440 hertz, and you have no instrument but your ear. And yet you will be able to say, what's a piano, what's a trombone, what's a bagpipe, et cetera, et cetera. You can say this because while people excite primarily 440 hertz, they excite different media. They, and the different media propagate different overtones with different strengths. They mix different overtones differently. And your ear, a very poor Darwin developed frequency analyzer is sufficient to disentangle between these different material properties. So that makes it credible why, for instance, in the early universe, we can now talk about dark matter by using exactly the same frequency analysis, looking at the fluctuations. But this is not the topic of this talk. Here, I go now to graduate level course in physics. And I say, if what, what am I doing here? I take a medium, say an energy momentum tensor, and I excite it with some perturbation that excites something in this energy momentum tensor. And then I look in the, at the response in time. And by listening to this response, I learn something about the medium. So in experiment, in fact, in heavy ion collisions, we can prepare such different excitations. For instance, simply by colliding event by event, different nuclei with each other, some of the event will single out with fluctuations in more elliptic shape, some are more triangular shape. We select different spatial eccentricities and we can control what we select. And we can measure the response in momentum space experimentally. We can ask how many of these charged particles fly in which angle to the detector so we can ask not only what is the linear response to these eccentricities, but also the nonlinear response. So first on the graduate school level, what can I say about such a retarded Green's function if it's perturbed by linear perturbation theory? Well, the voodoo of, of beauty of theoretical physics is that I can look at the Fourier transform of the Green's function. And I clearly, my energies are real, but I can extend it to a complex function. And the physics tells me then that this complex function has poles that are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the physical excitations. So, Poles is a concept from complex analysis, but without going to it, I can have different theories and I can't draw poles here, a blue one, a red one, another red one. And what I tell you is simply that by knowing the poles of this Green's function, I know the time scales on which 
these physical entities decay into the medium. So if I have a hydrodynamic pole here, then the distance from the real axis is the inverse of the time by which it decays. The deeper the pole is down in the complex plane, the faster it decays. Now there is something very generic that is true for all quantum field theories, for all theories we can look at. The first is all these theories have hydrodynamic excitations. Hydrodynamic excitations, you can define them operationally by saying, if I take this excitation and my, make my wavelength longer and longer, then this excitation lives longer and longer. This pole goes to zero. So typical, the dispersional relation goes here with k squared. For a shear excitation, if I have a shear viscous excitation, there's a prefactor. It's a shear viscosity over entropy density times one over temperature times this inverse wavelength, this wave number. Now, this is a behavior that is universal in all theories I can look at. It's universal because it's a direct consequence of energy conservation, of charge conservation. And poles of that kind are described by hydrodynamics. That's why they are called hydrodynamic excitations, simply because because there is a correspondence between the gradients, the spatial derivatives, and the wave number. Now, in addition, there are non-hydrodynamic excitations. Non-hydrodynamic excitations are excitations that escape this gradient expansion. They go and don't go to zero when k goes to zero. In the simplest case, this should be a minus, in the simplest case, they simply sit there and they don't evolve with K. Now, in quantum field theories, there is no plasma without such non-hydrodynamic modes. This is a consequence of causality. All quantum field theories must have more than hydrodynamic modes. Okay. So, okay, that was theory, but what do I do in the phenomenological practice when I look at this data. Clearly, I should start with hydro first because hydro is universal. The least I have to know about my medium is sufficient to formulate hydrodynamics. In fact, one can show that requiring energy momentum conservation and the second law of thermodynamics, only the law that locally at space and time, entropy always increases. These two coefficient, uh, conditions are sufficient to formulate a viscous hydrodynamics. Now, if I formulate such a dynamics, I have a time evolution based on minimal assumptions. But the quantity I, I put into this time evolution, they are of high interest. I have to put into the time evolution, for instance, a relation between the energy density, the pressure, and conserved charges. That's the equation of state. I put into it information about the sound velocity. That means how my pressure changes with energy density. I put into it information about how energy dissipates out of the locally co-moving rest frame of my fluid. That I do by a shear, by a bulk viscosity, also via conductivities in principle. If I go further, there are relaxation times I can put into that. That would be to second order hydrodynamics. Now, the important point here is that whatever I put into this hydrodynamics is calculable from first principles in the quantum field theory. And that means testing my hydrodynamics is the dynamical way of testing the thermal sector of fundamental quantum fields. And such, it's not only calculable, but we start actually calculating it. Here you see a perturbative calculation of the shear viscosity over entropy density ratio. All references are given very small in the bottom. Um, we have string theory calculations of some of these quantities. 
we start having lattice calculations, although some with, with very large uncertainties. Now, then comes the comparison to data. And that is a seminar in itself. And I only noted that in this seminar series here in Arizona, Stefan Bass gave half a year ago, link below, um, a beautiful one hour survey about exactly that problem, about how to best compare with Bayesian inference this hydrodynamic picture with data. It should be clear, clear that more than fluid dynamics is needed to simulate the system because the system needs to thermalize or hydrodynamize first. And I come to that in the second part of this talk. But the dynamics also contains fluid dynamics, the dynamics one compares to. And the fluid dynamics is also constrained. So here I show only one of these heroic efforts by a, a Dutch group. I have put the acronym Nies Gursoy, um, um, Van der Schee and, and Snellings, reference below. I think that's currently the state of the art. It's a distribution. Uh, it, they use four, 514 data points from LHC. So it's they start making use of the wealth of data produced at the LHC. They fix 20 parameters, some model dependent, some fundamental. It's, there's unprecedented detail in these studies. The two numbers I want to pick out is this ratio of shear viscosity over entropy density, and which is very small, smaller than 0.1, and it's this shear viscous relaxation time where a value of phi fish of kinetic theory is favored. So this is not a seminar now on this important numerical aspect. This is a seminar that tries to go beyond this fluid dynamic picture. But let me ask first how fluid is that fluid. And let me give you a feeling with fingertip physics. Before fingertip, let me make uh, explain that 0.1 for shear viscosity over entropy density is close to 1 over 4 pi, close to 0.08, which is a magic number for people working in the field. Because Policastro, Son, and Starinets showed in 2001 in a seminal paper that in super symmetric young Mills plasma. So not really the QCD, but sisters of QCD quantum field theories that are a bit different. And that have a gravity dual that have a string theory equivalent, a known one. One can calculate exactly this value. It was the first time that it's infinitely strong coupling the shear viscosity over entropy density could be calculated. Why is that conceptually interesting? Because I told you in the first slide that all matter we know is of corpuscular composition. And this is the one plasma, one kind of plasma that theories can set up where there is no scale except temperature. It's the one plasma that has no internal structure on no scale. So it's at least interesting, and people argue in that direction, that looking at an eta over s that is so small, one may arrive at a system that is of qualitative novelty. It's not the nth solid state physics. But that is a side remark. Let me now put the numbers I have derived into context. If we talk about a perfect liquid, we mean a liquid that doesn't, in which entropy is conserved. It's isentropic. Entropy doesn't increase. In the simplest case, there is a Björgen calculus where one looks at a one-dimensional Björgen, like Hubble, expansion. And there one can write a very, uh, this expansion 
has important similarities with the real, real world, I should say. And this expansion implies a dynamics of the entropy density that is governed by the shear viscosity. So isentropic is an expansion where the increase in entropy density is much smaller than the entropy. And if you translate that, you arrive at the condition that the eta over s should be much smaller than a typical time scale in the system times the typical temperature. And indeed, these numbers are always larger than one, if you make your guess. And that means this system is indeed close to isentropic. So in this sense, it's a perfect liquid. And that has motivated also already the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven to produce this cup saying Rick serves the perfect liquid. But now with a, with a, with a pole structure I explained to you, I can ask more. I can ask, is it that this perfect liquid knows only about fluid dynamic excitations? I know it's a quantum field theory that should know more than fluid dynamics. And the Bayesian inference I've shown you had given me a tau pi, and hence it had given me the position of that non hydropole So what I ask now is, given the excitations in this plasma, is the hydropole really so well parametrically separated from the non hydropole that my system is entirely governed by hydrodynamic excitations. So that would be the condition that this distance is much smaller than that distance. And if you rewrite that, you arrive at the wavelength, which is the inverse of K, that is of that form. There is of order of a factor 10 prefactor numerical. There is an eta over s that I take 0.1, it could be 0.2. There is a 1 over temperature, which I take 200 MeV, which corresponds to 1 Fermi. And my requirement for a hydrodynamics that is undisturbed by non-hydro degrees of freedom is a requirement that the wavelength of my excitations is so long that this is parametrically closer to the real axis and hence parametrically longer lived than that point. Now clearly, wavelengths that are much larger than a Fermi don't fit into a proton, they don't fit into a small system. They will fit into a lead, lead collision. But as I decrease my system, at least, I will certainly not, I should not be dominated by these hydrodynamic modes. And even if I entertain some separation that is not much greater, I could hope that with detailed experimentation, maintain, also non hydro modes become accessible in my system. So I can ask, how non-fluid is this fluid? How could I see some non-fluidity? And again, on the parametric level, I know that if I have a system of size R, the smallest wave number I can put into is parametrically order one over R. And the longest propagation lag time I can propagate that wave is of the system size because it, then it's out of the system. So if I look again in real space at this retarded Green's function in my toy world, I would put a one over R squared in here times an R. That goes like one over R. So as I decrease R, this quantity becomes larger. The hydropole dies out. On the other hand, this goes with R the non hydro mode lives longer. So clearly by going to smaller systems, I should be able to test and discriminate between 
the hydrodynamic excitations of which we understand a lot, and the non-hydrodynamic microscopic nature of my plasma of which we understand still very little. So how can I elevate this question beyond the toy level, beyond the parametric hand waving? Well, I could try, for instance, to ask what happens if I leave my hydro mode exactly at the point where it is, so that I look at two theories that have exactly the same hydrodynamic properties but that I change the non-hydrodynamic properties because I just need to know they are there. Their nature, physical nature is characteristic for the theory I look at. It's different for QCT or a different theory. So that's what we have done in a proof of principle calculation or let me say it less preposterous. That's what we have done in a toy model. We have constructed uh, you can say another hydrodynamics, or you could say another kinetic theory, or you could say another theory. It's a theory that includes, as all theories have to do, it includes hydropoles and it includes different non hydro excitations. The hydrodynamics of both theories is exactly the same. The relaxation of the non hydro modes is also exactly the same. The relaxation time is kept the same. However, the physical nature of the non hydro excitations is different. These non hydro excitations propagate a little bit while dissipating. This just sits there and dissipates. So, what we do is we run a dynamical evolution using one of these two theories. And then at a particular switching time, that is a function of the system size, we switch from this theory to that other theory. So if only hydrodynamics would be needed to explain the response of the elliptic flow to spatial eccentricity, this switching wouldn't matter because only the physical nature of the system matters. What you see from our study of that toy model is the nature of the non-hydrodynamic mode does matter. And it matters the more, the smaller the system becomes, as expected from these toy model calculations. I have given a talk at initial stages in Rayovot in January this year, where the technical details of that calculation are given in more detail. So let me now go back to experiment. Experiment at LHC, and that's why at CERN we have looked in so much detail in recent years into understanding the microscopic nature beyond hydrodynamics of this plasma. LHC has discovered collectivity in the smallest systems, in systems we didn't think of previously that collective phenomena occur. In fact, even in proton-proton collisions, we are able now to see small signs of this statistically significant anisotropy that I showed you. In proton lead collisions, we see it in lead lead collisions. This is not by far not the only observable. We see it in the hydrochemical composition that switches seamlessly from the most elementary proton proton collisions to lead lead collisions. The picture of particles that of quarks and gluons that collide and free stream while fragmenting to the detector. This picture cannot explain these signatures of collectivity. On the other hand, I have just given you parametric arguments that if you go into collision systems that are as small as proton-proton and you see the onset of these phenomena, then it becomes parametrically difficult to maintain the idea 
that they are solely dominated by hydrodynamic modes. So that's why we push beyond this current state of the art of perfect fluidity. I go now into a field that is seemingly very different. I told you about jet quenching at the beginning, about the need of understanding that if I inject a high energy parton in my system, that I need to understand how it fragments because I see, for instance, very large die jet asymmetries. Now, I want to emphasize that all the codes that one can look at in jet quenching, all the, the dynamics that we put into the medium interaction of a highly energetic part on its shower can be on some level be understood as a parton kinetic theory of a distribution function of hard partons, highly energetic P much larger than the temperature that are embedded in a medium spatial temporally and that undergo one to two and two to splittings or a parton splits on a soft medium that would be one to two, there could be two to three, there could be more. In this Arizona lecture colloquium, Xin Yang Wang, one of the founding fathers of the perturbative description of this branching process, has given recently a seminar to which I give the link below. Now, here, I don't want to go into the full coverage of the technicality of, of that branching, which is a, really a one hour lecture in itself. But I want to emphasize that there is something very peculiar about this kinetic transport. You see, if I do billiard ball kinetic theory, I scatter and my billiard balls fly all away from the point I've scattered, irrespective of whether they have high energy of soft and uh, or low energy, independent of how energetic they are. This here is very different. If I look at the vacuum branching of a parton into a quark and a gluon, then the idea of asking where in space time this fragment occurs is related to the quantum mechanical idea of a formation time, that this gluon needs to be, get, to be given sufficient time to be distinct in a measurable sense from that quark from which it branched off. This formation time is the inverse transverse energy. It's the gluon energy divided by the gluon transverse momentum squared. And if transverse momentum is replaced by angle times energy, you see that in vacuum, the softer my gluon is, the later this gluon is formed. So hard gluons first, soft gluons late. And if you equate soft gluon with medium, then you say medium never. That's an oversimplification. In the medium, however, this gluon gets its transverse momentum, not just by waiting in the vacuum till it separates well, it gets its transverse momentum from being kicked by the medium. And the softer the gluon is, the more easier it is to kick this gluon to large moment, to large angle. As a consequence, the same formation time in the medium implies that the softest gluons can are emitted first. And indeed, we see this experimentally. We see that the energy that is quenched out of the jet cone is distributed at all angles. The soft stuff is really moved away. We have qualitative support for that. So soft gluons first, and let me oversimplify again by saying, so equating soft gluons with medium and saying the medium forms fast. Now, let me go away from oversimplification. 20 years ago, Bayer, Müller, Schiff, and Son wrote a paper, bottom up, bottom up thermalization in heavy iron collisions. And five years ago, Kurkela and collaborators 
took that paper so seriously that beyond parametrics, they did the numerics. Here I show you this numerics. It's a numerics where I initialize a system that has only high momentum, quote unquote, jets. Momenta that are orders of magnitude below, beyond something I would call a temperature scale. So there is no medium, but I let this system run in a box. In a box that expands longitudinally as my heavy ion quotient expands. And I use this dynamics and effective kinetic theory of QCD that includes one to two and two to two processes. And what I observe is a surprise. What I observe is that the soft fragments, simply because some of them are there first, they induce a little bit of scattering. And the patterns finally scatter on the stuff they have produced themselves, and they hydrodynamize quickly. Let me phrase it this way. PQCD, perturbative QCD, has the most remarkable thermalization mechanism. Out of nothing as a medium, I get something and I get it quickly. Or in the words of this Bayer Müller Schiffson paper, an overoccupied system that undergoes longitudinal expansion will so first, and that is a bit anisotropic, that transfers pressure is different from the longitudinal one. Such a system, because of the expansion, will first, while some branching, some complicated dynamics emerges, become underoccupied. The occupancy will be much less than one. But then this parton shower kicks in, and the radiative cascade is infinitely fast compared to any billiard ball 2 to 2 process that we would have in a naive kinetic theory. And it's this effect that drives the system to thermalization. And where it was argued around 2015 for the first time that on time scales below a Fermi over C, we can reach hydrodynamic behavior at least for some quantities. So here we have a characteristic kinetic theory that is more than perfect hydro, but that encompasses perfect hydro. So I would go as far as saying, bottom up, this mechanism is a more encompassing heavy iron paradigm than the perfect fluid. It is more encompassing because it includes pre-equilibrium dynamics. And indeed, there are some works that show how that are used in phenomenologic comparisons and that show how the pre-equilibrium dynamics anchored in this effective kinetic theory give rise to what we propagate in the phenomenology currently with hydrodynamics. Yes, can it I, leads to can I rapid, can perfect fluidity. But as I emphasize, it's also a dynamics that accounts naturally for jet quenching because where we perturbatively control this dynamics, it is jet quenching. Now, if you entertain such a more encompassing heavy iron paradigm, then there are immediately many open questions. There are many, many elephants in the room that all walk to you. Um, you ask, of, of course, well, if that's the kinetic theory, what are the non-hydro excitations of that kinetic theory and how do I measure them? You ask, if that is the kinetic theory, can I understand something about hydrodynamization by understanding the onset of jet quenching in small systems? I, you ask, if that is the theory, what is the hydrochemic composition and its smooth transition telling me? What is 
Can I view transport of heavy flavor in that context? Many of these questions are not yet asked. And I want just to look at one of these many elephants at the room in the last few slides of my talk. Um, I have three more slides, Igor. I hope that's fine. So I ask about jet quenching in small systems. And I hope I have made it clear that collectivity, as I have defined it, requires final state interactions. And final state interactions, interactions after collisions of the patterns that escape, imply jet quenching. However, in the smallest systems we have studied so far, in proton nucleus, in particular, I've shown here, we can look, for instance, at the yield of nucleus nucleus collisions divided by the yield in proton proton collisions an equivalent number of such proton proton collisions. This is the famous nuclear modification factor plotted here. And what we see is we cannot detect this jet quenching in so far in these small systems. Now, there could be different reasons why we don't see final state interactions. One reason could be because the effect is simply not there. Well, if that is the case, then what I told you so far is simply wrong. And in fact, most of the dynamics we entertain, entertain in heavy ion collisions is wrong. If there is a medium, also the highest momentum particles must undergo some modification. Otherwise, there is no medium. The alternative is because the effect is too small to be measured so far. Then the task of a, of a theorist, at least, but also of an experimentalist, is to try to measure it better, to try to devise methods to measure it better. In fact, we know about uncertainties of this nuclear modification factor. Um, in particular, it entails not only high momentum perturbatively controlled physics, it, con it contains also geometrically assumptions normally here in this nuclear modification factor. So could we improve the null hypothesis on top of which such jet quenching effects can be seen? That's one question we have asked recently. And we noted that if one doesn't make a cut on the centrality of a nucleus, nucleus collision, that's of course well known, that if you don't cut on centrality, but we you look at the minimum biased nucleus nucleus collisions, then this geometrical uncertainty is gone and your baseline is purely perturbative. So you, we used all the precision available in perturbative calculations to provide an uncertainty band within which we know the baseline on top of which jet quenching could be seen. I should make it clear, the field heavy ion physics does not only live from such observables. There are many observables where we can't go into this limit, where some assumption of geometry is needed and well-controlled assumptions can be made. But if you look for the needle in a haystack, if you look for the small onset, if then it will be useful to have at least a small class of observables where your set of assumption is minimal. And an observable in which the only assumption is a systematically controlled PQCD standard is we maintain of qualitative interest for that discussion. So we see that we can get with a two to 5% theory precision the baseline, and I don't go through that. But then we have the question, how to estimate quenching signal in this oxygen-oxygen collision? And just to avoid the impression that we do only concepts and we don't do hard calculations, let me say here, we ask how to estimate quenching si signals by simply varying freely what you don't know. And that means we really run through many, many models 
of the initial conditions, of differences in the collective expansion that span everything from free stream to perfect fluidity, and of the microscopic dynamics of how this jet interacts, everything published in the literature is used here. Then we anchor this, these models, all these models on data that are measured. We see which of them work. We observe where they don't work. They underestimate the effect. They don't overestimate it. And then we extrapolate to oxygen, oxygen. And we see that this extrapolation should lead to jet quenching signals here in blue that can cleanly be separated from the baseline. So this is one of the many ways in which we think small systems can be used to get to that onset stage, to see how jet quenching arises in the smallest systems, or to refine our dynamical understanding of jet quenching. This is only one of many opportunities that are awaiting that field. And the opportunities that are specific for oxygen-oxygen collisions were recently studied by a, in a workshop at CERN organized by Jasmine Brewer, Alexas Matzeliauskas, Wilke van der Schee. You find many talks about many other propo um, proposals at this link. And you have a very beautiful and concise link um, right up by the three authors recently posted. Let me close with the two take home messages here. I hope I have convinced you that heavy ions test something fundamental. They are giving pro unique tests of how collectivity and how thermal properties arise from the fundamental laws of the non-abelian quantum field theory, from the most fundamental object we start with in understanding the microscopic world. I hope I have at least shortly touched the fact that we have made tremendous progress in recent years on understanding the hydrodynamic properties of QCD matter. And I would argue that with these Bayesian inferences, in some sense, this field starts reaching maturity. The aim is to better constrain the observers. I have also argued, and that's a, an argument that I put forward here as a single scientist, as a speaker or with my collaborators who have done that. I have also argued that in doing these Bayesian inference, in doing these precise measurements, we start being sensitive to non-hydrodynamic excitations of that QCD matter. I've given you parametric arguments for it. I've shown how the parametric arguments can be anchored in the Bayesian inference itself. I've shown you toy models in which I show that we are indeed sensitive to the inner workings of the QGP, as it was phrased in a um, National Science Foundation five-year plan in the US. I have argued that this is not a small epsilon extension. Rather, it could be at the beginning of establishing a more encompassing paradigm of what heavy ion collisions are. A paradigm in which we don't make any more a sharp cut between a medium that is a fluid and jets and hard partons that traverse through it, but where we have a dynamical understanding of how these two entities interact and how in fact jets create that medium in some sense. And I also hope that I have convinced you of the many opportunities, both on the experimental and on the theoretical side, that are coming up in the coming decades. As a theorist, I have clearly focused on the theoretical opportunities that I see in going for a new paradigm. But I have here links to proposals of what the fields plans to do 
in the next decade. So with this, I close. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. Now we will have some time for questions. I see some comment in the in the chat. Would you like to to uh, say it in person, or should I read it? I'm not sure about that. So let's start uh, with questions. Any questions? Yes, I had I had kind of one quick question and a comment in some order. I think the can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very Hello. good thing. So first of all, uh, so thanks, thanks for that talk. So even for somebody like myself who has heard many, many, many talks about this subject, this was a very nice, this was a very nice overview of recent results and new directions and so on. So thank you very much. Um, so my one little comment was, I mean, you you showed this kind of Alexi plot of you know sort of numerical bottom-up thermalization and um, my little comment about that was that the scales seemed absolutely ridiculous. I mean, so this was not meant to be a realistic calculation, was it? There were occupation numbers like 10 to the minus 15 and the momenta were 500 so, times thermal momenta. So, I mean, so, that so, must be some absurd recoupling limit. Is, it, is that right? So the one, right. So the one is to start with parametric pictures. And I showed the pictures that were like, by the way, also the parametric arguments of Bayer, Müller, uh, Sonschiff, where um, a parametric of that kind. I should say, and uh, possibly I picked not the most, uh, the best plot of that time. Um, these authors pushed also the coupling from uh, to, to uh, alpha S couplings between open 2, open 3. And in fact, the time scales that I showed on the lowest plot, um, I apologize for. Um, so here there are, there are, this is clearly a, a, just a, a hand drawn picture. But uh, in these publications, you will see that as the, you go from absurdly weak coupling to realistic coupling, the time scale changes and you get of that order. Now, I mean, clearly, the, the saying that, that, I have to hasten that this is, you start with a perturbative transport, and then you push it into a non-perturbative regime. So you can endlessly debate on whether you are quantitatively reliable or not. It's just suggestive on that side. Mm. Um, and I think that's what it is. On that level, it's suggestive in the pure theory world. Where it gets less suggestive is if you take the same dynamics and you use it for a pre-equilibrium dynamics that interfaces with the hydrodynamics that you use to calculate this, this hydrodynamic quantities. And that's what is done today. I would, I would argue that, for instance, compost arises from the intellectual logic that was opened and pushed by these early bottom-up thermalizations arguments. And I would argue that it is of great interest to push this logic further. And I would argue that there are some publications in the literature, for instance, on understanding hydrochemistry in these pictures that push this logic further while not anymore being in this pure, extremely weakly coupled, completely ridiculous theory work. But clearly, I emphasize that part, I hope I have made it clear, is hypothetical. It's a hypothesis that goes beyond the current state of the art because I think the field after having scrutinized a perfect liquid for 15 years needs to ask also about the perspective to go beyond that picture. And I think that is the most exciting picture that doesn't throw out the perfect liquidity and still gives us a view of what to look for more. 
And that's why I emphasize it in such a colloquium. So, yeah, I mean, I agree completely, of course. Uh, maybe I can get to my actual question. So, the, um, so if we study fluid dynamics in very small systems, it's of course very difficult to do it quantitatively, but at least in principle, we understand indeed where these kind of finite size effects come from. It's a more initially viscous corrections and then it becomes non-hydrodynamic modes. If you do the same for jet quenching calculations, so you take, for example, these old exercises where you work with bricks of a certain size. I mean, does one understand sort of quantitatively what controls the finite size effects in a system like that? If I have a 100 TeV jet and it punches to a medium that's only a Fermi across what the finite size effects are? Well, so, so there, are, there are different levels to that. It, it, it clearly, uh, it depends on what you call finite size effects. It is certainly true that the models we have used and extrapolated down to small systems, oxygen, oxygen systems, um, are models that um, where one can rightly ask whether um, decreasing the, the in medium path length to zero, whether they should be expected to work. Um, on the other hand, the system where we have used these jet quenching models are systems that are not smaller than the systems in semi-peripheral lead lead collisions where these models have been used before. On a, a conceptual level, let me say that some of the earliest calculation of thermalization, for instance, in quantum field theories with gravity dual, were exactly of that jet quenching character. What you would do is, for instance, um, uh, Chesler and Jaffe type calculations around 2010, you would inject a high energy quote unquote jet into a, a super symmetric uh, Young Mills plasma. And you would ask simply, what is the length scale or the time on which I cannot distinguish that jet from a thermal environment, or in that other string theory language, what is the time scale on which that string falls into the black hole, into the, the thermal, thermal bath? So yes, studies of the length dependence of thermalization can be linked to, uh, to jet quenching. Also, there are parametric estimates of how if you evolve a parton shower in a medium, how this partonic cascade has not only a scale where the medium induced partons become of order one, um, alpha s of the coupling constant, but you have also an understanding at what scale the partons, at least parametrically, become of order one and thereby create a system that then infinitely rapidly evolves to smaller scale, that means to the smallest scale to the heat bath. But clearly the quantitative level of asking that question is a level for the future. It's a level for deciding exactly about how to understand jet quenching in small systems, in systems where we can measure precisely like these oxygen, oxygen systems I mentioned, and that will soon be started for the first time at the LHC. Okay, um, I think Qingyang Wang had a comment, so please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, hi, it was there. Hi, Qingyang. <laughs> for this is uh, either a comment or a question. You, you have this, uh, all the, you know, for ox oxygen, you have all the model, you know, sort of uncertainty, what, yeah. what, what do you call it, right? And um, I'm sure you you have taken this uh, <clears throat> this model prediction from different model. I'm just wondering whether um, are all those model actually being constrained by the existing uh, like heavy arm data from both RIC and LEC. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, I especially want to give us sort of the band of variation that is reasonable, and you don't want to just take everything in the kitchen sink and put it there, right? Yeah. So, 
So there is a there is a positive and a negative statement I can make. The positive statement is um, uh, to some extent inc included here. Clearly, in uh, the publication, we have even more plots. So they don't fit all on a PowerPoint slide. Mm. Um, you see that as a function of system size for lead lead for xenon xenon and as a function of centrality out to semi peripheral collisions these models do generally well the outliers are models that have in extreme in medium path length dependencies they were disfavored before also i emphasize in order to get an extrapolation to oxygen oxygen it's important that these models don't overestimate existing data, they underestimate them. So if I show in this plot something, I may underestimate the effect, but I have no model informed reason to expect that I have overestimated the effect. So that strengthens our argument that oxygen oxygens should be possible, that, that one should be able to cleanly separate the two effects here. Now, we have communicated to Rick some extrapolation for oxygen oxygen collisions. There are other uh, physicists here in the bottom, in particular, this very nice paper by Andres et al., that's the Santiago group, where they have used one model that has similarities with what we have and it extrapolates nicely to, um, uh, to, to, to rig nuclear modification factors with a Q hat on which they make very specific um, statements because their aim was to nail down this quenching parameter. Our aim is here just to provide an agnostic uh, extrapolation. Um, as you know, as one of the founding fathers and one of the practitioners in that field, um, the nuclear modification factor, while showing some nice dependence, is not the most decisive way of, of a disentangling between models. Yes. It's a really robust one. Um, as you know, and as all of us know, um, if we would have full jet quenching models, and I hope in one of the transparencies, I put the reference to the main ones on the bottom. So where we don't test only the leading fragments, but all fragments, that the tests could be much more decisive but the uncertainty would be significantly larger. Now, in the context of a community-wide effort, we had already in 2018, in this report, tried to come up with such conclusions exactly for that reason. We had one of our working groups asking exactly how can we extrapolate jet quenching models to small systems? We did run at that time, for instance, Jewel, and we tried some other codes. Jewel is the only one that is published in that uh, paper. And we observed that without additional tunes, these codes would overestimate the nuclear modification factor for two jets. And we noted that already in 2018. So when we made this study now in 2020 to single out single inclusive hard runs, we knew about these studies from 2018. The only thing that came to our mind was to ask the Jetscape collaboration whether they have something better by now, because we know that there is a large number of collaborators under weapon in this collaboration. And we were told by that collaboration that there is nothing that can be used and that at this moment, the code is not running. That was for, for oxygen, oxygen. That was state August, September, 2020. So what I would maintain is that at moment, this moment, this is a study of the one observable where we can faithfully extrapolate to small systems without go getting overexcited or exaggerated on the 
model uncertainty, simply because here we know how robust RAA is compared to everything else, and you are the one who knows it best, okay? So that's why we have zoomed tiers only into single inclusives. But I want to warn, none of our collaborators is so nuts to claim that this is the only way of getting into the heaven of theory. This is the start, not the end. We don't run around and say this is the only perfectly calculable quantity, so you must mention, measure only that. We just note, gee, look at it. Rather than modeling everything, there is still the possibility with a bit of invention, with a bit of kick, to give this a different angle, to do something that is convincing in a different way also to the guys on the high energy physics side, with which our field is sharing accelerator, with which our field is sharing detectors, with which our field is ultimately sharing intellectual property. That's the point we make. Yeah, and yeah, all the discussion yeah. we have had a week ago in this nice Berkeley seminar about the importance of die chats of more of back to back correlations where more physics enders, beautiful and physics enders. It's not something we throw out. It's just something we don't emphasize in writing a four page paper. Yeah, okay. my, my point is that if you, uh, you know, if you, uh, the authors of those models are more careful about, uh, you know, constrain their model not only but they uh, not only but uh, the RAA but also uh, other observables and also most more the hi the hydro they also have to constrain too, right? If so, you take all this into account, I my my intuition that the, the error bar here could be be smaller. Um, what do you shoot? So, then what do you shoot? So. I agree completely that with, uh, with somewhat tightening the assumptions, you get smaller error bars. <clears throat> that, uh, that is without any question. Um, now, once you get on the model side, smaller error bars, you have to communicate more what you have done. Yes. Okay? yes. Yeah. That is awesome. And that, that's, that's let sometimes me, let out me of just your control. Say, let me just say, for instance, <laughs> I, I do believe that the technique that Jetscape collaboration has available can improve this calculation exactly by tightening this as you say. I note, however, that the current state of the art of Jetscape, for instance, takes one model not, in, not without event fluctuations, that it takes one particular kind of dynamical attenuation rather than the full spread we have here. And it doesn't interpolate, for instance, between the extreme assumptions of interpolating a medium between free streaming and perfect fluidity. Now, you may rightly say that is too extreme a variation. We know more. We know that this is not free streaming. I told you at the beginning. But what I say is I look at such a robust observable here that I can say, I can even give away with saying, I know almost nothing about the medium. And still I can go to my high energy friends and say, I will see this effect in that observable in three years when you switch on the accelerator. So it's an argument of a different kind. It's an argument that is too narrow to carry an entire field, but it's an argument that is powerful in a corner in which a broadband approach may have failed or has failed at least so far. Because for systems of this size, we don't see jet quenching so far. Okay, okay. thank you. So next question from Victor Ambrose. Um, hi. Hi, Victor. Uh, I had a question regarding free streaming. So you did mention it a few times, um, but then when when you talked about these kind of um, uh, hydrodynamic and non-hydrodynamic behaviors, uh, it seemed like you only showed the type of um, damping uh, which is exponential, whereas free streaming would come with a polynomial damping, uh, t to the minus one to the minus two. So I'm wondering if there's any seat on the table for this kind of um, uh, fluctuation. 
Oh, okay. So, so, so free streaming in the way I have in the way I have introduced it here is uh, is a temple. Imagine imagine that you have um, imagine that you sit on a path on that undergoes a, a high energy interaction, and you are thrown out into the vacuum. You you sit you sit on this path on you fly. As long as you don't interact, you may fragment simply because you were produced in a highly virtual process. And that means uh, your clock is ticking and on a time scale one over your virtuality, you have to split to get back to the real world. That's the quantum mechanical picture. So the way I use this word free streaming is a bit hand wavy in this sense. Clearly there is more dynamics than a particle that runs from here to the detector. Uh, such particles don't exist in QCD. They are confined, as I said at the beginning. Rather, what happens is they may fragment without any further interaction. They fragment in the vacuum. That's the default. And it's that default to which I referred to as free streaming. And then the deviation from that default would be some kick, some interaction, some, something weakly perturbative, possibly in a classical field, whatever. Then, then, then you can try to enumerate whatever physics you have in mind, okay? And what I said is my, my dynamical response is testing this deviation from that free stream. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any other questions before we wrap this up? I don't see any raised hand hands anymore. So uh, using the opportunity, I would like to uh, thank Urs uh, once again for a nice presentation. And with that, I think we will end up the official part.